on the golden throne, a girl wielded a sword and thrust it through the neck of a young man. He looked up at her in disbelief, and she, with a face as unyielding as stone, declared that she could also be of the royal bloodline of Hiu's auntie. The young man remarked that it wouldn't save her from the curse. Kanoelia, the second princess of the Hiu's aunt empire, smiled, stating that she no longer desired anything. The emperor of Hiu's aunt chuckled mockingly at her. Kanoelia, unfazed, said she didn't mind being cursed if it meant killing Han. Suddenly, he questioned her motives, wondering if this was her final scheme to gain his attention. Kanoelia, startled, looked at him, and he continued, asking if this was her last ploy to make him notice her. Kanoelia, taken aback, contemplated his words. He questioned whether she believed that the other person would pity her death, calling it a fantasy. The emperor stated that the one she sought forgiveness from would never spare a member of the royal family. He predicted that they would soon destroy the empire. Kanoelia fell into silence, finding it hard to believe. Then she gathered herself, refusing to let the wretched emperor manipulate her further. She raised her sword once again, declaring that she didn't care about the curse. Her only desire was to kill him, having heard enough of his deceitful words. The sword, stained with blood, pierced through him once more. With a firm voice, she expressed her indifference to the curse and her sole intention to end his life. As the emperor's head rolled off, the once mighty Hughes aunt empire officially collapsed. Canolelia sat there, contemplating the consequences. She took a step towards the golden throne, and the sound of rebellion echoed through the corridor. Yet, in her moment of triumph, the outside remained quiet. On the last day of the empire, she believed someone would come. If she killed the emperor earlier, would things be different? She regretted not being stronger. If she was stronger, maybe she could have protected the one she loved. Holding the emperor's head in her hands, she pondered if this was her final scheme to gain his attention. Canalelia was interrupted by the sound of footsteps approaching. She apologized for being the last remaining member of a healthy empire. Everyone else had perished. She offered apologies if he sought revenge, claiming responsibility for his pain. Outside, the gates broke, but the room remained tranquil. Canoelia hoped he could find new happiness. She acknowledged being the cause of his suffering and genuinely wished for his happiness. She collapsed on the throne, feeling it was enough. Before her vision faded into darkness, she apologized once more. She regretted not having the courage to say she loved him. Suddenly, she felt something strange, a warm embrace. It felt like she was held in that embrace, warm and comforting. She sensed a drop on her face, quickly fading away. Ultimately, everything came to an end. All she wished for now was to see his smile again, as enchanting as when her brother had asked if she liked him. She felt extremely shy looking at him back then but in her brother's eyes she saw a calculating glint. She cheerfully affirmed that it was evident she liked him, but she didn't know how much time had passed since then. Now, lying in a bed, she pulled the blanket up. She couldn't comprehend why she was under this blanket. A woman rushed in, asking if she was awake. The woman happily revealed herself as her nanny. However, Canoelia could tell she had run away, leaving her behind. Confused, she looked at her small hands and sat up in astonishment. She threw the blanket aside, wanting to get out of bed. The nanny tried to stop her, but she quickly ran to the door. She reached for the handle, turned to face the mirror, and found herself as a child. The nanny, smiling, asked if she had a nightmare. Canoelia didn't respond. Instead, she stared intently at the room. It was a familiar white room with beautiful furniture. At this moment, she just realized it. Perhaps she had returned to her childhood. The Hiozant Empire had a tale with a noble family blessed by God. Any eye attempting harm to Hiozant would be cursed forever. 
This slogan had been passed down since the establishment of the Hughesant Empire, serving as a warning for those with dreams of rebellion against the royal family. The so-called blessing from God helped the Hughesant family maintain power over Canada. Hughesant, the second princess of the empire, born into the Hughesant family with golden hair. However, the second princess, with her black hair like the night, was none other than her. At that time, the steward informed the emperor that the princess was born with black hair, considered ominous in the Hughesant empire. The emperor, however, stated that her hair resembled her mother's, and he gave her a perfect name, inspired by a unique flower named Canophelia. The cursed princess, that's what others called her. While people avoided her, there was someone who indirectly approached her, her grandmother. She always cared for her. After regaining her memories and returning to her childhood, she called out to her grandmother. Her grandmother took her hand and cried, expressing happiness that she finally acknowledged her. Despite the tearful face, she denied it, pushing her grandmother away. At that moment, her grandmother looked at her in disbelief. Suddenly, she claimed that her throat hurt too much. Her grandmother was taken aback, stating she would fetch some drinks and return quickly. As her grandmother left, she stared in anger, uncertain about what was happening, convinced she was cursed after killing her brother. Looking down, she lifted her dress and saw bones for legs, her body tiny like a candy stick. Despite feeling fragile, upon closer thought, she still felt pain. Certain this wasn't a dream, she believed it was the curse she had incurred. She couldn't comprehend whether this was how the curse worked, but it was worse than she thought. If this was Hugh's aunt's curse, she was willing to endure it. The Fu brought water back to Canarelia's room, urging her to lie down as the medicine had taken effect. She boasted about the many people who sent medicine for her recovery. Canova smiled, skeptical of her words, but her grandmother focused on her smile, claiming it radiated energy. Handing her the water, Canoelia found it too cold. She asked about the day, having been in bed for over a week, losing track of time. Her grandmother mentioned it wasn't her birthday yet, expressing hope for a complete recovery to enjoy a joyful birthday. Reflecting on her past life, she recalled how her grandmother had responded. Despite feeling confused, she had laughed along, thinking her grandmother truly cared for her. Now her grandmother urged her to drink the water quickly, claiming she felt heartbroken hearing her uncomfortable voice. Disturbed by the discomfort in her voice, she felt nauseous but realized there was poison in the water. Her grandmother believed she would never discover it, but few weakened her mind and body, manipulating her like a puppet. Refusing to be deceived, she suddenly handed the water to her grandmother, claiming it would make her throat hurt more if she drank it. Her grandmother, puzzled, accepted the innocent-looking water. She asked her to drink it, causing her grandmother to panic for a moment. However, quickly regaining composure, she smiled, took the water, and drank it all in one go. In the intense gaze of Canoelia, she exclaimed how refreshing it was, as if suddenly remembering something. She mentioned she accidentally drank all of Canoelia's water, but Canoelia didn't consider it a problem. Suddenly, her grandmother remembered something and said she would prepare food for her. If she needed anything, she should just call. Looking at her grandmother's hand placed on her head, Canoelia quickly smiled in agreement. Her grandmother took the water and left the room. Canoelia stared in the direction she left, her mind filled with conflicting thoughts. Her grandmother felt fortunate today, as there was no poison in the princess's water. Otherwise, she would have poisoned herself already. Yet, she sensed that the princess was different today, wondering if she knew about the poisoning. It has been five days since she woke up and discovered herself as a child. She is focused on recovering her health, feeling constantly weak and tired. Suddenly, she asks her grandmother to try the food on the table, and her eyes shine strangely. Her grandmother complies, eating without any concern, claiming it's delicious, 
and although she doesn't know who made it, the food is exceptionally tasty. Encouraging Canoelia to eat quickly, she responds, taking a bite and complimenting it as well. However, she wonders why the food seems so bland. Her grandmother mentions that she will prepare even more delicious dishes once Canoelia fully recovers. While stirring her soup quietly, Canoelia feels lucky that her grandmother isn't poisoning the food at the moment. She knows her grandmother will resume poisoning her when she falls ill again, then stop when she recovers. The grandmother continues to administer the poison, creating a never-ending cycle, bringing joy to the one who hired her. The grandmother cheerfully asks if Canoelia wants to read a book after eating, glancing at her. Canoelia, looking into her eyes, expresses gratitude towards those who sent medicine for her recovery. The grandmother, puzzled, inquires if Canoelia wants to thank AI. Canoelia corrects her, expressing thanks to those who sent medicine and wonders if they also sent ingredients for today's delicious meal. Aware of her grandmother's confusion, Canoelia suddenly hugs her, stating that she wants to show gratitude to those who sent medicine for her recovery. The grandmother asks if Canoelia wants to visit someone, and in that moment of confusion, Canoelia stands up, claiming she will take a bath alone. Turning to her grandmother with a smile, she instructs her to clean up the table. In the bathroom, she closes the door and opens the water tap vigorously, drowning out the voices outside. She undresses, staring at herself in the mirror, contemplating her luck that her grandmother isn't currently poisoning her food. She understands the inevitable cycle of poisoning and recovery that awaits her. After a while, she steps into the bathtub, feeling the excessively cold water making her shiver. Despite the discomfort, she insists she'll be fine. As she walks down the corridor with her grandmother, she hears the continuous hateful discussions about her. Ignoring the comments, she continues forward but suddenly stops, her face turning pale and extremely tired. The grandmother suggests they can return, but she disagrees as they are already here. At that moment, a man steps forward behind Canoelia, introducing himself as the royal palace steward, stating that no one can enter the royal office without an appointment. He emphasizes that he is sorry for the inconvenience, but that it's the protocol. The steward's sudden appearance surprises both the grandmother and the steward himself. However, Canoelia tells him it's okay and asks him to inform her father of her visit. The steward, shocked, stares at the young princess. She assures him it's her first time visiting her father and insists he informs the king. The grandmother and the steward, both amazed by Canoelia's words, respond accordingly. The grandmother tries to persuade Canoelia to wait for her return, worried that she might get sick again if she goes out. Canoelia smiles and hugs her, pretending to agree. She mentions that her grandmother can thank everyone on her behalf. As she walks towards the royal office, her grandmother, still panicked, calls her, urging her to come back, not wanting to anger the king. Ignoring her, Canoelia continues with a mischievous smile. When she reaches the royal office, her father, the Emperor of Hyozant, greets her. He smiles, addressing her as the daughter he hasn't seen for a long time. However, his face turns cold, questioning why she came here. Canoelia stares back at her imposing father, then calmly informs him that she came to report that someone poisoned her food and drinks. The steward and the grandmother are equally shocked. The emperor raising his eyes, looks at Canoelia. She questioned the king. Whether these things were all done according to his orders, or if the king raised his hand to stroke his beard, he did not deny it either. Turning the question back, she asked, what if that's the case, then what? Canoelia remained silent, looking at her father for a moment. Then she thanked him for letting her know about it. Afterwards, she dipped her knee, seeking permission to leave. But suddenly, the king called her back. She stopped in her tracks, glancing back. He said that she had not yet answered his question. The king stared at her, observing her reaction. After a while, 
he suddenly said she should sit down. Once again, she knelt at the king's command. She sat down on the chair, determined not to make any mistakes and to concentrate fully. The steward brought tea to the king's place, and similarly, the king had one served for Canafelia. The king asked, If he were the one giving you poison, then what? And would she let herself be poisoned to death? She smiled, realizing her father's lack of delicacy on the matter. She thought he might find it intriguing that his own daughter, who had been abandoned, came to visit him, and even showed concern for her. The room suddenly fell into heavy silence. She looked at her father and thought he might continue poisoning her until her death, but noticed that she was still alive and trampling through everything. She opened her mouth, saying that he was the king and ruled over everything, and if he wanted her dead, she would do anything to make it happen. The steward couldn't understand how such a young girl could speak so boldly without blinking an eye. At this point, the king pondered for a moment, looking at his weakened daughter with pale skin. He couldn't understand how she could be so defiant, while she could faint at any moment, and more importantly, he didn't know what she was thinking. Suddenly, the teacup on the table spilled over. She comforted herself, assuring there was no need to fear that she had to stay calm dealing with her father. He recalled her words that she would do anything to turn it into reality. He ordered her to end her life now and ask if she would comply. The atmosphere at home was now contemplative. Canophilia faced her father, silent and not saying anything. But on her face, there was still a serene smile, staring intently at her father. At this moment, the king was astonished, seeing something incredibly unusual about her. He stood up, slamming the table, making tea spill out. Then he shouted, Why is this happening? The steward also panicked, calling for the princess. But now the steward realized something. Canalelia had bitten her own tongue, and blood was flowing from her lips. The steward came over and handed her a cloth to wipe the blood. The emperor asked if she dared to play a mind game with him or what. She admitted her mistake. The emperor relaxed, thinking she was as clever as a fox, stepping on the line, but not crossing it. He said he never ordered anyone to poison her, and asked if she wanted him to punish the one who gave the order. She had been waiting for him to say that since earlier. She said she didn't want that, because what she wanted was even bigger. The emperor, puzzled, looked at her, and she smiled, saying she wanted to give them another chance. She collapsed on her bed, not remembering what happened next. But when she woke up, her nanny continuously showed concern for her. She thought the steward might visit her at some point, and the nanny's face turned pale. She still kept on insisting to call her, but she said not to wake her up before tomorrow morning. The nanny gritted her teeth in anger but agreed. Now, in the emperor's study, he was thinking about his daughter's words, saying she wanted to give them another chance. Suddenly, he thought of his daughter's name, Canalelia, meaning justice. He sighed and asked the steward, Princess, does she have anyone else to serve her besides view or AI? The steward confirmed that it was true. The emperor sighed, wondering how he thought she would beg for mercy, not a chance to vie for the throne. But he thought giving birth to Canophilia was the only thing he did right. Now, in the pouring rain, Canophilia was crying and running away. In the darkness, she kept running forward, but she had to stop because she was too tired. She turned her head and looked into the darkness, but something made her feel extremely frightened. Her older brother had caught up, standing behind Canalelia, saying he had captured her. Canalelia woke up in a panic, feeling tired and bored. Every morning she woke up drenched in sweat, all because of a nightmare. Furthermore, her body was too weak. After meeting the emperor, the nanny continued to ask about the events of that day, but she used her strength to answer her. 
But now she felt better. After sleeping and eating sufficiently, as she gradually adapted and familiarized herself with this young body of hers, she summoned all her strength to push the window open. Finally, the door in front of her swung wide open. Stepping outside the corridor, she gazed into the night. The cold air outside felt truly unfamiliar. She revisited the past with memories of an intact future. However, one thing remained unchanged. She was still alone. At this very moment, she felt that way. But she needed to find people who could be loyal and trustworthy. This time, she decided to be a bit different from her previous life. She resolved to ensure that her curse would not affect him at any cost. The next morning, the old lady shouted to wake her up. She sat up, thinking it was still early, but the old lady was in extreme panic. At this moment, a steward stepped in and pushed the old lady aside to greet her. Canorelia also sat up, acknowledging his greeting. He then ordered him to enter. She asked why he had come at this time. The servants around thought she had voluntarily gone to meet the emperor, so it couldn't be simple. However, she suddenly smiled brightly, stating that finally there was a guest visiting her palace. This made the two embarrassed servants blush and look at her awkwardly. The steward said that from now on, they would stay to assist her. Lady Fu was bewildered and didn't understand his intentions. Canorelia looked at the steward and said that she was fine, and the old lady had taken good care of her. She asked the old lady if she would never abandon her, because all decisions had been made for her by the old lady. The old lady stammered, saying that it was natural, and she always decided whether to keep or dismiss A.A.'s, and all decisions were hers. At this moment, the old lady was in panic, explaining to the steward that it was just a misunderstanding and thought the princess was still in a coma. She needed time to wake up. However, all three of them stared at her with incredulous expressions. The steward stepped forward, saying that these people were better than her old lady, and they would do their best to meet all her needs. They committed to being loyal to her and taking care of her for a quick recovery. The steward mentioned that Her Majesty sent a message for her and asked the servants to leave. But the old lady still stood there in disbelief. After they left, Canarelia asked the steward if Her Majesty had responded to her request. The steward put his hand inside his coat to pull out something. Canarelia stared at his hand curiously, and he took out a scroll, placing it on the table. After she finished reading it, she wrote that her father had given her a chance, but it wasn't free. She guessed she would have to work harder to prove herself. Suddenly, she heard that he had something to say. While Canoelia was still reading the scroll, he said it would be best for her to stay calm because the poison was just child's play. From now on, everyone in the palace would monitor her every move, and it wouldn't surprise him if there was an assassination attempt in the near future. Canoelia asked what she should do. He advised her to keep a low profile and be motionless like a chess piece, waiting for the right moment. But she argued that he had said too much. She smiled, saying that she understood he was worried about her, and she knew she would be safer if she stayed quiet. However, she didn't think she could just do that. The steward was slightly surprised, and she handed him the scroll, asking if this is what Her Majesty wanted. The steward put his hand inside his coat again, taking out something. Canorelia stared at his hand, and he pulled out a scroll, placing it on the table. After she finished reading it, she wrote that her father had given her a chance, but it wasn't free. She guessed she would have to work harder to prove herself. Suddenly, he mentioned that he had a few words to say. Canorelia was still reading the scroll, and he said he thought it would be best for her to stay calm because the poison was just child's play. From now on, everyone in the palace would monitor her every move, and it wouldn't surprise him if there was an assassination attempt in the near future. Canorelia asked what she should do, and he advised her to keep a low profile and be motionless like a chess piece, waiting for the right moment. She argued that he had said too much. 
She smiled, saying that she understood he was worried about her, and she knew she would be safer if she stayed quiet. However, she didn't think she could just do that. The steward was slightly surprised, and she handed him the scroll, asking if this is what Her Majesty wanted. The steward affirmed that it was a confession that she was the second princess of the empire, currently inheriting the throne. The steward was shocked, looking at the scroll. She said it seemed like her father wanted her to survive by fighting fiercely against those trying to harm her. The steward, who was a colonel serving the emperor for many years and a living witness to the crimes committed by the emperor, said that his advice would save the second princess's life. However, the difficulty here was that the second princess was only eight years old. She just smiled at him after hearing his words, as if she already knew everything about her future. He couldn't understand how she could be so confident. She said he would never know what life would throw at him. Therefore, he should do whatever he could before death, knocked on his door, just like her father, who always silently wanted to kill her. The steward wanted to advise her to endure under the emperor's leniency during that time. The royal family, in confusion, looked at her for a while, not knowing whether she had given up this opportunity or not. However, she stated that she had no intention of avoiding it. The steward told her that it would have consequences. She spoke into the recorder, saying that she couldn't underestimate this matter. Then she put her hand on the table and the steward curiously followed her gaze. She said she had given up the curse when she requested an opportunity to ascend the throne. At this point, the steward was startled to hear what she said. She needed to abandon the curse if she wanted to inherit the throne. She spoke exactly like the emperor. At this moment, he couldn't forget the moment he received the princess. Both the princess and her father were cut from the same cloth. Even if she might be a separate entity, she still carried royal blood. She suddenly told the steward that her birthday was approaching. The steward asked if she had any plans for the celebration. She expressed a desire for a grand celebration, with lots of things to enjoy this year. The steward wondered if she wanted to celebrate becoming an official member of the royal family or not. Nevertheless, he agreed to convey the message to the emperor. Finally, she seemed satisfied and allowed him to leave. Suddenly, the old lady rushed in, running in front of her. She was terrified, asking what she had told the steward. Seeing her frightened expression, Canoelia thought at least she would bring her a glass of water. However, at this moment she called her. Surprising the old lady, she asked if she was the only one she trusted and if she knew that. The old lady confirmed it, and Canoelia looked at her, stating that she was tired of living in the dark. The old lady listened to what she said next. She mentioned that her father had put her in the line of succession, and he gave her this scroll as proof. She asked if it was wonderful. At this point, the old lady seemed frozen on the spot, and she quickly left. Canarelia knew that she was definitely spreading the news to her owner, but this was just the beginning. She sat on the chair, surrounded by servants bowing to her, including five servants and six attendants. However, there was no sign of a knight. They were well-trained and extremely polite, but none of the AIs among them was completely loyal to her. She told them that since they were in her palace, it meant that they were completely loyal to her. No one stepped forward, saying that they promised to serve her the best they could. She observed that two servants were sent from the Queen's palace, two from the second prince's palace, and two more from the third princess's palace. The remaining five were sent from the royal palace. Having a sip of tea, she asked them if they could gain their loyalty. The atmosphere became tense, and she told them that if they made her lose trust, she had no choice but to consider them enemies. She felt like they had started to understand each other better. She asked the two servants to stay, and the rest could leave. Then she questioned the two remaining ones about who sent them to her palace. The boy said he applied for a job at the royal palace upon hearing about the shortage of staff. He didn't request to be sent here. Now, Canoelia looked intently at the remaining maid. 
and asked if she couldn't express herself through actions. The male servant responded that he didn't know what she could do. She was the kind of person the princess should pay attention to. Suddenly, something flashed, making his blood flow. The male servant held his neck, realizing that there was blood on it. He collapsed in a pool of blood, and the knife was in the hands of the remaining maid. After killing him, the maid stood motionless without doing anything. Canoelia embraced the maid excitedly and said she had been waiting for her for a long time. She then called her Ellie, and in her stunned expression, Canophilia stated that she was always alone. She explained that anyone who showed kindness to her had to suffer a cruel death. When she accepted her younger brother as the one behind everything, Canophilia had pushed everyone away. She always tried to mock and drive them away. Only Ellie refused to leave her. She didn't want this poor girl to stay because she would face danger as well. However, Ellie had stayed by Canolia's side until the last minute. Ellie turned into a pool of blood in front of Canolia. Her younger brother had brutally killed this poor maid, considering it just killing a dirty insect in the palace. Canolia was horrified, looking at the pool of blood before her. Her younger brother said she would be forever alone until he lived and breathed. She called the name of her maid, and she quickly knelt down, twisting the sleeve of her clothes. Canolelia stared at the maid's actions, horrified by what she had witnessed. Ellie showed Canolelia the writing on her hand. It read, I swear to destroy your enemies until the day I die. Canolelia felt that this girl hadn't changed at all. She speculated that her mother must be a formidable person to prepare someone like Ellie for her. She was curious about what her mother had taught Ellie to make her unconditionally loyal. Firstly, Hanarelia told Ellie that now she belonged to her, so she didn't want her to harm herself. She emphasized that Ellie was the only one she could completely trust, and now she was her reliable servant. Holding Ellie's hand, she sincerely thanked her for coming to rescue her and overthrow this filthy palace. The two searched the body of the recently killed man for a few daggers. Canorelia recalled that he was the assassin sent by her younger brother. The room now had a strong smell of blood, making her lose her appetite. Suddenly, the old lady pushed the door open and was horrified to see a dead body in the room. She didn't know what had happened, but Canorelia rushed into her arms, pretending to be scared. She told the old lady that the servant suddenly fell and the rug started turning red. The old lady realized it was an assassination, but was relieved that the princess was still alive. She found it illogical, but accepted that the princess, now hungry, needed to have her dinner. In the dining room of the second princess's palace, they had to clean up the dust to have a meal there. Hanorelia remembered the old lady's face and was sure she was wondering how she was still alive or the servant was not. Next, the new maids would try their best to gain her trust and control her, just like what the old lady did. Therefore, Canorelia was certain that the food on the table was not poisoned. She mentioned that the food looked delicious, and whether it was poisoned or not, she believed she could enjoy it. The group of maids started getting anxious, requesting to check the food for poison. However, Canoelia told them it was unnecessary, took a piece, and put it in her mouth. She assured them that she knew they wouldn't poison her dinner. The maids were now extremely worried and frightened. Canoelia comforted them, saying there was no need to worry, and she looked forward to the next meal. The maids stared at her leaving, thinking she was too small and weak, just a child. They believed she probably wouldn't touch the food and wondered if she was poisoned. One maid thought that the young girl just witnessed a death and wouldn't have a good appetite. However, she turned her head to look intensely at the maids there, thinking she needed to find someone loyal to her. Suddenly, she stopped calling Ellie and told her there was something she needed to know. Canorelia asked Ellie if she knew whether her younger brother received blessings from their spirits. Ellie quickly shook her head. She explained that whoever dared to end her younger brother's life would be cursed. It was his blessing, 
and because of that curse, she returned to the past for a second chance. In her previous life, Yol took everything she loved, and she took revenge by beheading her younger brother. But the one who brought her back to the past was her younger brother. Even though it was hard to understand, Canarelia wanted Ellie to know that she did her best to protect her in her previous life, even though she was weak and helpless. She couldn't do anything to prevent Ellie's death. Therefore, she wouldn't let this happen again. She wanted to become the Empress and overthrow this hellish empire. In the ruins, she wanted to protect the ones she loved. She hoped that Ellie would stick with her because serving a cursed princess wasn't easy. Ellie expressed her desire, and Kanoelia considered it her command. Outside the palace, it was raining heavily, like an appointed agreement. The old lady had never been loyal to Kanoelia, and she promised her a large compensation for serving Kanoelia. She had three tasks, to keep an eye on the princess all the time, make sure she was always sick, and regularly report on her condition. The old lady believed that the second prince would eventually ascend to the throne, securing her reward. Luckily, she enjoyed the princess's current carefree life, but suddenly she noticed a change in the second princess. She realized that the second princess was no longer herself, and she thought she had reached puberty. The old lady wanted the second princess to return under her control. She expressed concern about the change in the princess, about the events that occurred yesterday, when Kanoelia requested everyone to leave, except for the two servants, and questioned why Sao didn't call her to stay, warning her of potential danger. Seeing the fake concern in the old lady's eyes made Kanoelia nauseous. Now, she didn't care if the old lady was concerned or not. The old lady asked why Kanoelia requested the two servants to stay, and Kanoelia replied that they had to keep an eye on her. However, the old lady left her alone in the dining room to gather information about the deceased servant, possibly sent by her father or the prince. Kanoelia questioned the old lady about who sent the servant, her father or the prince. The old lady was shocked, and Kanoelia remained calm, looking at her with composure. The old lady shook her and warned her to be careful with her words. Kanoelia then asked if the old lady wanted to know what the servant did in her room and revealed that he took his own life while cursing her. She needed to find out who sent him to avoid danger. The old lady, who was likely the employer of the deceased servant, was certain that Kanoelia's father warned her. Kanoelia continued to inquire if the old lady knew who sent the servant and shouted, questioning how SAO could possibly know. The old lady tried to prevent her from visiting the emperor, assuring her safety within her bedroom. However, Kanoelia suddenly turned to the old lady, expressing her desire for a grand birthday celebration. She mentioned that her father promised to host a distant flower banquet for her, officially introducing her to everyone. This would go against her father's wishes if she stayed in her room. Kanoelia then turned back to the old lady, stating that she liked intelligent people and found genuine warnings terrifying but reassured her that she was fine. She rushed towards the old lady, asking if she knew what had happened in Sao, then hugged her, saying that the old lady always promised to protect her. Afterward, she happily asked the old lady to fill the bathtub for her expressing her desire to take a bath. Inside the bathroom, she called Ellie, instructing her to watch and assist as needed. However, at this moment, Kanoelia thought it wasn't the right time yet. After the death of the crown prince, no one dared to oppose the two princes. However, the second prince always had a volatile temperament until Kanoelia received the succession rights. The appearance of Kanoelia trapped the nobility in uncertainty and some began to express doubts about her. People continuously discussed Hanafelia's name among the upper class, but they didn't know she was an A.O. They believed she was just a useless princess with no benefits. A man with red hair overheard the discussions, smiling. He expressed disinterest in getting involved in their foolish discussions. His servant reminded him that his father advised him to behave politely with the upper-class nobility, 
However, he didn't understand what his father saw in them, and the servant mentioned that his father had a talent for recognizing truly important people. The servant asked if he also supported many princes who were often discussed. The servant was shocked and feared that others might hear. Accidentally, he mentioned that the young master agreed to attend those parties was an impossible thing. The servant didn't know how to explain to the duke, feeling that his young master was misbehaving. Nwang Japan, the heir of the Japan dukedom, had just left, thinking about the two princes and how they might be cold-blooded. If they ascended to the throne, everything would collapse. This was the perfect time for the princess's grand introduction. Canophilia's presence created a wave on the smooth path of his succession. The only trap was that nobody truly understood anything about Canophilia. No one doesn't know if Canophilia is truly wicked or not, but he understands that her actions will affect various aspects. He worries about his friendship with Duke Fenbuck and is uncertain about what his friend will say to his father. Norwalm acknowledges that his friend is a skilled tactician who can arrange everything. However, his concern is that he doesn't know much about the princess with black hair. In California's bedroom, lying on her bed, the window's glass is shattered, and there's a knife around her neck. An intruder aims to assassinate her. However, California's calm face chills the intruder when he realizes she's smiling at him. She calmly calls Ellie, asking her to quickly draw the neckline. Ellie swiftly approaches from behind the intruder, then thrusts her hand into his neck in a sudden motion. California sits up, composed after sketching. Approaching the lifeless body, she doesn't know what to do with him. Such an incident never occurred in her previous life. Falks would assassinate her right away once they heard she stood in the line of succession. Looking at Ellie, California says she knows what to do. She asks Ellie to place the body outside the royal water fountain. She wants everyone to know that someone visited her at midnight. Ellie quickly carries the assassin out, and California can't believe they brought poison for an eight-year-old princess. It seems more dangerous than she thought. Crushing the poison in her hand, she smiles, feeling she did nothing wrong. The next day in the palace, Early in the morning, a group of armored people enters California's palace. They search every corner, and a guard steps forward, saying they find it impolite to enter a princess's palace without permission. However, the guard remains indifferent, stating that they only follow orders from their superiors. If anyone obstructs them, they'll face the consequences of disobedience. Canophilia calmly asks the guard, if his superiors ordered him to search the room of a young princess lying in bed. The guard replies that they found an unidentified corpse inside the royal water fountain, and they were ordered to search the entire palace. Canophilia questions if this is related to her, and the guard says they have to find something, not just SAO. He claims she can't do anything since she's just a princess with no power. He accuses her of pretending and remaining calm, being a true noble. Suddenly, her face turns dark, and she looks down on him, causing him to panic. She questions what the knights did when the corpse was found in the royal water fountain. Only a maid was inside her room, making her superior embarrassed. The guard quickly apologizes, and she requests some privacy from Savan to change out of her nightgown. The guard is surprised that she knows his name, but he dismisses it, thinking she misheard or made it up. However, he agrees to let her change. A servant quickly changes her clothes, and Canophelia reminds the servant not to speak unless she allows it. The servant apologizes and promises to be more careful. Canophelia continues to caution the servant not to interfere or try to protect her, because it's not worth risking their lives. The servant apologizes again, and Canophilia calmly reassures her that it's not her fault. She then goes outside for a stroll in the garden, realizing she can't remember the last time she did so, and feels lucky to go unnoticed due to her small stature. The narrative is engaging with a mix of suspense, mystery, and the princess's unique abilities and demeanor. 
If you have specific questions or directions you'd like the story to take, feel free to let me know. Ellie is worried about Canoelia's safety, and Canoelia comforts her, explaining that's why they decided to go out for a walk. Suddenly, Canoelia asks Ellie if she has heard about the ghost in the royal mansion, a tormented soul still seeking her lost daughter and son from the inheritance battle. The former queen, rumored to be mad, supposedly lives alone in the mansion, waiting for her deceased children to return. Canamelia tells Ellie that she can take care of herself from here and suggests Ellie go back to the room. Ellie agrees, looking at Canada as she leaves. Canada walks along a path filled with yellow flowers, symbolizing desire, with the sweet aroma filling the air. She stops when she sees a woman who also notices her. The girl is admiring the yellow flowers scattered around. Camellia realizes that this girl is the one she has been looking for. She approaches, and the girl moves closer, gently asking if she is Maria. The girl strokes Camellia's cheek, thinking she's her unfortunate daughter. Tears stream down the girl's face with joy, believing her daughter is still alive and has grown into such a beautiful child. Feeling the warmth of the girl's embrace, Canarelia still senses an emptiness. She softly speaks to the girl, encouraging Queen Angela to wake up as time is running out. She urges Angela to revive her spirit and take action. Angela's eyes suddenly calm, and Canarelia gazes into them. Angela asks if she is truly an AI. Canarelia introduces herself as Canarelia Hughes' aunt, expressing her willingness to serve Queen Angela. Angela recognizes the names of her two lost princesses, but doesn't understand why Canoelia is here to find her. At this moment, they hear the approaching sounds of people. Canoelia knows that if they discover her here, she won't be at peace. Angela quickly points towards the bushes, instructing Canoelia to hide there. Canoelia swiftly heads towards the bushes as the knights arrive to greet Queen Angela. The knights inquire if the eye has come, and they are sure they heard the queen talking to an A. Angela takes advantage of the situation, seizing one knight's arm, claiming him to be her son. She says she has been waiting here for a week, expressing disappointment that he hasn't visited her. The knight looks puzzled, and Angela mentions he seems taller now. The remaining knight is confused, thinking Angela might be insane as it has been five years since the prince's death. However, Angela insists that she is waiting for her son and the other prince. The knights eventually leave, believing Angela is mad. Canarelia feels fortunate that Angela distracted them. Angela tells Canarelia to approach, and they enter the queen's castle together. Inside, the castle is adorned with beautiful yellow flowers. Angela holds Canarelia's hand leading her step by step. They reach a table where Angela instructs Canoelia to sit. Canoelia obediently sits down, looking at the tea set in front of her. Angela sips her tea, then asks Canoelia why she has come to find her. Canoelia explains that she has thought carefully about it. She knows there must be someone with shared enemies, someone who desires the cruel fate that will befall Queen Angela, her two princes, and their close associates. Canarelia wonders if I might be the one harboring such desires and why she came to find Queen Angela. Angela remains silent for a while, looking at her own portrait hanging on the wall. She finally asks if California is saddened by the fact that she has nothing left. California responds that her only possessions now are her heart and soul as everything else has been taken for the sake of the Hughesant Empire. She vows to reclaim the Empire and won't let it fall into their hands. Angela gazes into Canoelia's eyes, sensing truth and determination. She asks if Canoelia needs her help or if she just wanted to share her plan. Canoelia affirms that she needs Angela's assistance. Angela observes Canoelia, realizing that despite being a child, she possesses an iron will and an intense desire for vengeance. Hanalelia smiles, knowing that she finally has a chance with a potential ally. Angela remains silent, 
contemplating Canorelia's words. Finally, she asks Canorelia to speak more about her plan. They continue the conversation, forming a connection that may lead to an alliance against their common enemies. The story is developing with intriguing characters and a plot filled with suspense and political intrigue. If you have specific directions or questions, feel free to guide the story further. Ely felt that this room was excessively white, giving her the sensation of being in a mental institution. Earlier, Canophelia had instructed her that when the emperor arrived at the banquet, she wanted Ely to be at her residence and then use fire to burn the place down. For her, it would be the greatest birthday gift ever. Ely, taking advantage of the chaos caused by the fire, escaped the palace while two soldiers rushed to fetch water to extinguish the flames. Meanwhile, Angela, at the Imperial Palace, was shocked to discover that the girl possessed the divine power of Hell Jant, a blessing from the gods. The Venbat family, on the other hand, received a similar divine gift. Azelatina questioned Bitar about the severity of the girl's words, considering the already strained relationship between the Empire and the Commonwealth. Guitar believed that the most crucial thing now was to save the princess. Angela asked Azelatina how she felt, and after a moment of silence, she reluctantly agreed. Rita, with joy, thanked Azelatina for trusting her, and with a wave of her hand, a golden light enveloped Canophelia. While her body showed signs of recovery, the princess remained unconscious. Guitar urged Angela to continue talking to the princess, emphasizing that there was much to be done and the situation couldn't be concluded yet. In a dream, Canophelia found herself back at a time when she had grown up. Her brother allowed her to marry Harry Venbat, but she was terrified because it wasn't what she wanted. I.E. ill, T.S. reassured her that he would withdraw his troops as Henry desired. Illy quickly thanked I.E.L.T.S., who declared that he had received news from the Venbat family. The head of the Venbat clan had passed away. Harry, now officially the Duke of Venbat, congratulated himself. Hanophilia, shocked, heard her brother say that she should be happy because she had become the wife of the Duke. Despite her sorrow, Hanophilia knew that her apologies were insufficient before these tragedies unfolded. Harry would be confined within the Venbat family estate for a year, prohibited from leaving to oversee the Commonwealth. During this time, the responsibility for the Commonwealth would fall to the second princess. Additionally, to show Harry's loyalty to the Empire, he must gather financial reports over the next decade. The Imperial Edict also commanded the Duke to lead troops to exterminate any threats approaching the Hell Giant Empire. The Venbat Commonwealth was directed to provide funds to aid the famine-stricken people of Hell Giant. Another decree ordered the Duke to send a foreign delegation to establish trade agreements with neighboring countries. Canophilia read the royal orders with increasing anger, making her tremble with fury. She shouted, demanding that they release her husband. Engia, thinking she was mocking him, smiled, and Canophilia pleaded with him promising to do whatever he wanted if he freed her husband. Enja, amused, stated that seeing her cry shattered his heart and warned of consequences if she used her powers to cause him heartache. In a fit of rage, Canophelia swore that if she could overcome Enja, she would never bring Ailey to Yale's place. She vowed to ensure their paths never crossed again and that she would only observe Ailey from afar without dreaming of being with him. She felt the weight of her guilt, knowing she would personally kill Wael with her own hands and end the torment for Haley. Back on the bed, Canophelia remained unconscious, but her complexion improved gradually. Rita noticed the change and expressed optimism about the princess waking up soon. Angela thanked Rita, acknowledging the debt they owed her. Angela asked Rita if she planned to return to the Commonwealth immediately to which she replied that she would stay until the princess fully recovered. Engia, on the other hand, learned about the awakening of the princess and the former Queen Angela. Engia felt neglected as people focused on the second princess, considering her just a child. 
He believed many princesses were merely attention seekers, unlike his cunning engagement in the party. Angela inquired about Canophilia, and Rita assured her that she would stay until the princess was well. Angela understood Rita's intentions of wanting to speak to Canophilia after her awakening. Angia approached his servant, questioning where the Venbat Harris had gone. The servant claimed ignorance, prompting Angia to speculate that Guitar might have taken a detour without seeking assistance. At this point, a servant rushed in with a panicked expression, reporting that the two princesses had awakened. Angia confronted the servant, questioning how dare she intrude in such a manner. The servant explained that someone claimed the Venbat Harris was present at the banquet, and the royal physician predicted that the princess wouldn't recover without a blessing. Yale found amusement in the situation, thinking Canophalia had no right to receive a blessing since she was a hybrid. The servant reported that the princesses were visiting the queen and former queen. Angia, intrigued, decided to go to his mother first, recording that his governess was imprisoned. However, he feared causing a disturbance and decided to visit his mother before approaching the imprisoned governess. In the queen's room, a servant informed that the Venbat Harris was present in the feast. The queen, initially confused about why the princesses would visit her, realized that Canophilia might have come to persuade her to join her side. She envisioned manipulating Canophalia into testifying against the governess, absolving herself of any consequences. Upon reaching the dining room, the queen cheerfully welcomed Canophalia, claiming to have prepared a meal for her. Canophalia, silent, gazed at the food. The queen, misunderstanding her lack of response, felt humiliated, assuming Canophalia was ungrateful for the meal she had prepared. Canophilia quickly apologized to Azelatina, explaining that Azelatina meant no offense and was only concerned for herself due to her constant fatigue after eating. D-I-C-L-A, feeling a bit relieved, sensed that she was still far from being strong enough to confront the queen's son. Canophilia explained her presence, stating that she had heard D-I-C-L-A had encountered trouble and she had some questions for her. Canophilia directly asked D-I-C-L-A whether she wished for Canophilia's death or not. D-I-C-L-A, startled, inquired about Canophilia's intentions. Seeing D-I-C-L-A's shocked expression, Canophilia repeated the question, asking if D-I-C-L-A wanted her to live or die. D-I-C-L-A responded that, as the daughter of the emperor and also D-I-C-L-A's own child, she naturally wished for Canophelia's well-being. She emphasized her innocence and claimed she never poisoned anyone. Canophelia smiled and said that was all she wanted to hear. Now she aimed to find the culprit who had poisoned her and accused the queen. She expressed her desire to justly punish the person responsible. The queen, now uncertain, questioned whether Canophilia sought to clear her name or not. Canophilia stated that those who committed crimes must face appropriate punishment for their cruel actions. Shortly after, in the palace dungeon, Azalatina, fearing the pressure Canophilia might feel, suggested they should visit the emperor's place instead. However, Canophilia believed it was the right time to visit the queen. She asked Azalatina, if she could ensure Canophelia's safe return. Azelatina, after briefly observing her, asked if Canophelia intended to meet them after this incident concluded. Canophelia sighed and admitted that she did not wish for that. She acknowledged a new kind of power that could cleanse the poison from her body, a power she did not deserve from the Venbat family. Enja suddenly appeared, confirming the rumors about Canophelia were true. He noted her improved appearance and mobility. Yael, joining the conversation, asked if Canophelia had visited his mother. Canophelia affirmed and mentioned that she had received permission to interrogate criminals. Yael wondered why she bothered talking to him. Canophelia stated that she didn't understand why he was curious, but now had the authority to ascend the throne, and soon he would know if she was truly blessed. She bid him farewell and left, 
prompting Enjia to marvel at her dynamic and lively nature, expressing hope that she wouldn't disappoint him. Canophilia entered the dark dungeon with Angela. Angela asked if Canophilia could handle the situation alone. Canophilia reassured her, saying she didn't need to worry. Canophilia proceeded into the gloomy dungeon, looking towards a cell where the governess was sitting. She greeted her as the governess, but quickly corrected herself, addressing her properly. The governess, shocked, looked at Canophilia. Canophilia asked if she was surprised to see her alive. Canophilia mentioned that the governess had been acting strangely since the encounter with the emperor, and now she wanted answers. Canophilia asked if the governess was surprised to see her alive, stating that she had disappeared a long time ago. The governess, trembling, insisted that Canophilia had been missing for eight years. Canophilia pointed out that the governess started behaving differently after meeting the emperor. Canophilia also hinted at the possibility of the governess being responsible for her apparent death. The governess, now agitated, accused Canophilia of pretending. She suddenly vomited blood and fainted. Canophilia questioned her, asking if she truly understood what had happened. She informed the governess that she had been missing for a long time and had only recently reappeared. She mentioned the poison, the hired assassin, and the queen's permission for her to deal with the governess as she pleased. Canophilia warned the governess that even if she met the queen, it would result in her death. The governess, still in shock, claimed that the queen had allowed her to use the poison on Canophilia and couldn't believe the queen would abandon her. Canophilia reminded the governess that the queen knew she was aware of everything, including the hired assassin and the poison. The queen permitted Canophelia to kill the governess because of this knowledge. The governess, looking at her caretaker, asked how Canophelia wanted to deal with her. The governess, trembling, claimed she only followed orders without any means to resist the queen's commands. Canophelia, gazing at her, asked if she truly understood what had happened. The governess seemed unable to comprehend and Canophilia noted that she began behaving this way after meeting the emperor. Canophilia explained that she had disappeared for a long time, and her return was recent. She hinted at the governess being involved in her supposed death. The governess, now anxious, accused Canophilia of feigning her death and suddenly vomited blood before collapsing. Canophilia, maintaining her composure, questioned, whether the governess truly grasped the situation. She informed the governess that she had been granted permission to deal with her as she saw fit. Canophilia warned the governess that even if she met the queen, it would result in her death. The governess, still in shock, claimed that the queen had allowed her to use the poison on Canophilia and couldn't believe the queen would abandon her. Canophilia, in response, reiterated that the queen permitted her to kill the governess because of her knowledge about the hired assassin and the poison. The governess, looking at her caretaker, asked how Canophilia wanted to deal with her. She trembled and claimed she only followed orders without any means to resist the queen's commands. Canophilia, gazing at her, asked if she truly understood what had happened. The governess seemed unable to comprehend and Canophelia noted that she began behaving this way after meeting the emperor. Canophelia explained that she had disappeared for a long time, and her return was recent. She hinted at the governess being involved in her supposed death. Canophelia then addressed the governess and asked if she wanted to be cleared of the charges or not. The governess, overwhelmed, struggled to answer. Canophelia, with a deep sigh, indicated that she might not be able to save her and left the dungeon. Engia, feeling a strong heartbeat, considered Canophilia to be a lively and dynamic child distinct from the crone prince. He expressed hope that she wouldn't disappoint him. Canophilia firmly held the governess's hand, expressing her understanding of everything. She acknowledged the complexity of the situation and her decision to give the governess another chance. Canophilia advised the governess to escape after she chased her away, considering it an opportunity for her to flee. However, the governess, 
despite the chance given, returned once more, seeking another opportunity. Canophilia hoped the governess would learn a lesson this time, because, in her words, it was just the beginning. Meanwhile, in the Emperor's chamber, he expressed disappointment with Canophilia. Canophilia clarified that not everything was as it seemed and that she took the risk for a reason. The Emperor, irritated, questioned why she had come here. Canophilia explained that she wanted the Emperor's help. Although the Emperor felt she was asking for too much, he inquired about the assistance she sought. Canophilia expressed a desire for an investigation into the conspiracy and poisoning. She emphasized that revealing the Queen's involvement could damage the royal family's reputation. On the other hand, not exposing the truth might lead people to perceive her as weak. Hanafilia proposed providing all the evidence to the former queen and additionally requested a favor for Eselatina, the ability to remove her caretaker's tongue. The emperor asked whether Hanafilia wanted the governess dead or not. Hanafilia responded that she wished the governess to endure and suffer for the rest of her life. The emperor found her perspective intriguing and acknowledged her fluency in speaking. As the emperor called for the governess to be removed, Canophelia continued speaking, stating that she knew her position. Even though the emperor could strip her of the throne at any time, she believed in her ability to stand against the ILTS. The emperor approached her, asking if she truly had more requests. Though annoyed, he allowed her to continue. Canophelia proceeded to discuss her plans. She aimed to bring the Chinata family back into the political map, deliver letters, and pay stolen money to M. Ki Genti. The emperor, surprised, noted her knowledge of the diseased M. Ki Genti, a loyal follower. Hanafelia confirmed and explained her intentions. She suggested reducing the number of nobles by half until her coming of age, causing the emperor to ponder her audacity. The emperor then expressed his desire to strengthen the royal family's power. Canophilia pointed out that she knew he wanted to regain attention among the nobility. She suggested that by eliminating weaker nobles, the remaining ones would support the royal family more effectively. The emperor found her suggestions aligned with his desires and asked if she had more in mind. Canophilia, aware that her father hoped for her to discuss arrangements with him, assured him that she had more to say. The emperor, intrigued, inquired about her additional requests. Canophilia, maintaining her calm demeanor, spoke of her plans to initiate an investigation to ensure the queen was not accused, securing her reputation. Simultaneously, she intended to reclaim the place of the Chinata family in the political landscape. The emperor, seemingly impressed by her articulate proposals, asked if she had more demands. Canophilia continued, explaining that she wanted to ensure the survival of the princess. She stated that divine intervention was the only way to save her, aligning with the words of the royal healer. Furthermore, she hinted at her miraculous survival, leaving the emperor surprised. The emperor admitted that Canophelia spoke truthfully and that he had nothing to lose. Despite being a child, she had a bold plan. The emperor asked what she wanted in return for her proposals. Canophilia, with a sly smile, stated that she would remind him of her requests every time she achieved one of her goals. Meanwhile, in the capital city, a girl ran into her home exhausted. She had managed to deliver something exclusive, but she quickly closed the door behind her. Breathless and fatigued, she had just received something poisonous at the princess's birthday celebration. After gaining the throne, they were determined to capture the culprit. Since they had everyone leave the party, she overheard that the former nanny of the princess had poisoned her cake. It was the most glorious birthday celebration ever, yet the princess collapsed and was poisoned. Not only that, Prince Wael and Princess Jenny Bella were also present, ensuring another bloody bath in the royal palace. Now, she didn't know which newspaper to sell this valuable piece of information to. Suddenly, she remembered something. She went straight to her desk, forcefully placing her hands on the table. She remembered they wanted her to spread rumors earlier because she received a new dress 
and an invitation a few days ago, albeit from an anonymous letter, but it was also an offer she couldn't refuse. The sender had a simple request. She had to remember the details of that night and spread the news throughout the empire. Luckily, it was relatively easy to get in due to the presence of the two princesses, and almost no one followed her, despite her lack of knowledge about etiquette. Until she saw it on the high stage, thanks to the princesses being the center of attention, she could move easily at the party. But the only thing that worried her was not knowing why they chose her to spread the news, but if they wanted someone to disseminate information, they chose the right person. That night at the local tavern, people were enthusiastically discussing the princess's party. Still, they kept asking Natalia how she knew all this, and everyone attending the party couldn't stop talking about it. She explained that all of it was not just a coincidence, and I had tried to kill Hel Jant's second princess. Furthermore, the palace in Seo brought the participants home without conducting a thorough investigation. A guy among them found this plausible. Natalia asked him what the first thing Enja did when he came of age was. It was controlling the media. All media focused on positive propaganda for Enja, and those restricted from accessing information believed in the lies and revered him as a god. Enja's popularity constantly skyrocketed, and people believed he would be the most powerful emperor they had ever seen, unaware of the dark truth dreaming of prosperity under his reign. But there was someone who wanted to bring the truth to the public, the violence and harassment by the prince. Inappropriate harassment exceeding level 7, more than 627 future palace servants were killed. And that someone was Natalie. So, the princess collapsing at the party was Engia's fault. Outside Seo, Engia's actions began to go beyond control going too far to protect his right to the throne. She was the only one writing positively about Canophalia, updating articles, continuously speaking about the prince's evil deeds. He got angry and wanted to find the one writing these things and drag them here. Finally, Natalia was brought in front of him. He claimed he didn't know what made her believe. She could escape writing lies about him. Natalia said it was an honor for her and she was very busy writing about him. At that moment, someone held her head, saying they had to get to the main issue. He threw a bag in front of her, full of money. He said he would make it worth her time if she wrote what he requested. Natalia sarcastically said he had a deal with M. Kijenti, probably selling at a high price, but the public had the right to know the truth. How could So become an emperor when his dynasty lived on lies? He laughed at the idea of living justly, asking if Natalia had a previous life for a minor crime and spreading lies about the royal family, leading her to be considered a traitor and beheaded. Kofa was reading newspapers, thinking the queen must be in a panic. Angela also believed many princes must be busy hiding the details, but it spread widely, bringing endless joy to her. She knew the queen was quite pleased with the current situation, and she had been depressed for years. This small victory seemed to add strength to her. She said news of the nanny would reach the queen soon, keeping her silent. Azelitina smiled, asking about her hairstyle, advising not to exhaust herself since she hadn't fully recovered. Canophelia smiled, saying she would be fine, and Azelitina was satisfied with her answer. Canophelia entered an ongoing festival, accompanied by her maid, Ely, heading towards the head butler. She stated that she was here to meet the emperor. The butler opened the door, saying the emperor was waiting. Canophelia stepped inside, greeted the emperor, and he immediately shouted, asking if she wanted to show him things like this in Seteo. She replied that she didn't know what he was talking about. The emperor angrily threw newspapers in front of her, questioning if everything she said was just a random coincidence or if the palace's news was leaking outside and if she had posted all the events of that day. The emperor, frustrated, asked if she had anything else to say. Canophelia explained that she had not left the palace since she had a headache and thus 
How could she plan something like that? It seemed like a mere coincidence. She wanted him to look closely at her weakened body and the many poisoning marks on her skin. He would realize she had no conditions to escape the palace. She asked what she would gain by revealing this information, as it portrayed her as the subject of gossip. The emperor, now somewhat convinced, allowed her to leave. As she walked out with Ellie, she called her maid and instructed her to find someone for her discreetly, ensuring they wouldn't be caught. Additionally, they had to be extremely cautious. She knew the emperor was aware, so she needed to come up with a plan B. Within the royal prison, the palace servants were shocked to see the princess, tears streaming down their faces. Canophilia apologized for their suffering these past few days and expressed genuine concern. The maids confessed that they thought they would be abandoned for much longer. One of them said they never dared to dream of such a thing. Canophilia explained that they turned a blind eye whenever the caretaker poisoned her food and drinks. They believed she would forget those incidents forever. Now they realized she knew all along. They began to fear the consequences. I.E.L.T.S., a brother, suddenly entered, asking if their punishment was death. The other maids thought he came to forgive them and begged him to save them. Enja, however, looked at them and asked if they were still alive. He was surprised, as they should have all died by now. He turned to his sister, asking if she wanted to let them out or if there was something else on her mind. Canophilia was startled, not wanting to involve her younger sister Venbat in this matter. She had to make sure they weren't connected to her. She claimed that her palace had some gold items, entirely made of gold, causing them to emit a yellow light. This seemed to satisfy the emperor, and he let her go. Canophilia left with Ely, but as they walked, she called her maid and told her that she needed her to find someone for her, emphasizing the need for secrecy and careful movement. She knew the emperor was onto her, so she needed to plan for contingency. The remaining servants looked at Canophelia with a mix of fear and gratitude. They explained that they had genuinely worried for her, thinking she would suffer longer. Canophelia apologized for their suffering, even though she didn't feel happy about it as it proved that the princess had fully recovered. At this moment, thousands of questions filled Canophelia's mind about Esao. She didn't understand why, despite threatening and exploiting the maids, they still genuinely cared for her well-being. She wondered what their true intentions were and how she could use that knowledge to her advantage. Suddenly, IELTS walked in, asking if their punishment was death. The other maids thought he came to forgive them and pleaded for him to save them. Enja, however, seemed surprised that they were still alive. He turned to Canophelia, asking if she wanted to release them or if she had something else in mind. Canophelia, taken aback, didn't want to involve her younger sister Venbat in this matter and tried to ensure they weren't connected to her. She claimed her palace had gold items that emitted a yellow light seemingly satisfying the emperor, and he allowed her to leave. As she exited with Ely, her mind was filled with questions about Sesao and how she could use the situation to her advantage.